Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Camille. Go okay. Oh, I heard just Camille. Sorry. I'm Camille Gomez. Hi, Camille Gomez. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. So we have a we have a couple of us. That's better than none. That's yeah. Nice to meet you. Um. So yeah, we're um. We're. I want to go through the material for the test on um, the war for independence to make sure Camille that you're ready to um, uh, to to ace this part of test number two. Okay, All right. I will. Because you guys are um, you guys are doing really well on the argumentative assignments, and I, I'm I'm not I'm not too worried. But of course, we can go over those if you like as well. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, so but firstly, before I, I start on the study guide, uh, do you have any questions? Um, not right now. Okay. I've, I've, yeah, I've just been reading and stuff. Good, good. Well, I'm hoping, does it, do they seem to, what my goal is, is to have them supplement one another so that, you know, I, if I, all I did were the argumentative things, of course, I try to, to, to put in as, as arguments that have a, a decent amount of data in them so that you're actually at least learning some facts along with your argumentative stuff. But if that's all I did, you know, I, I would imagine the students would feel like, well, what the heck? What, I want something more linear, like what happened when? What's the, the kind of narration of events, right? And so um, I do that with a, the textbook and have you try to gain a, a, a basic command over the narrative of the textbook uh, by reading. And then with the quizzes, I try to go, I try to scratch the surface a little deeper than that for, uh, to have you guys critically think and also to, um, uh, to have anyone who's going to major in history be able to discern where an historian is coming from. So some of my, uh, my questions about Brinkley's textbook are interpretive, right? Uh, where I say, okay, what, what's his take on this topic? What seems to be his, um, his point of view, his, his assumptions that he's bringing to uh, the table? Uh, but it, are you guys finding that somewhat, that the, that the textbook readings and quizzes and the argumentative are kind of supplementing each other? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, Sandra, right? Sandra Garcia? Yes. Okay, good, good. I hope so. That, that's my intention. I mean, because if I just did a narration of events, then you wouldn't need me. All, all you would need is a textbook. Um, and so that's why I try to, there was kind of a method to my madness when I try to have you guys do a lot of these argumentative pieces. And then as I often want you to, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to give you too much work and certainly not that you can't intellectually handle it because you guys are, are acing these argumentative assignments, but just time invested. So I usually ask that you just do one if, at the very most two sections. But I, of course, remember to read all of them, right? Uh, because then, uh, sure enough, there'll be sections that you didn't choose on your assignment and they will have answers to questions on the test. So be sure to use those as study guides uh, for the test as well, okay? And I'm not proud of multiple choice and true false. Uh, it's kind of passe or archaic. Uh, as, for, as far as teaching styles, uh, but I just, I have so many students that as far as having essay um, tests, they would just get crazy. Um, I have five classes and they literally average 80 to 85 each class. So it's just a long time grading stuff. So I hope you guys understand. And I'm also converting things to online version, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm not accustomed to usually. I, I keep about half the answers to the test uh, reserved to my lectures. So anyway, I'm trying to put more of the answers in the argumentative assignments, et cetera. So are you guys ready to, to, uh, to go, down, go down the list of your study guide? Any questions? Okay, so I, I'm gonna take that as, as, as you're ready. Um, wait, I actually have one question. No, please. Okay, so I'm looking at the calendar, and for me, it says we have two argumentative assignments due on Sunday. 
Is it only one or is it two? Do. Oh shoot. Um, you know what? I think I accidentally doubled up on the same one. Uh, do they, they do they have oh, okay. the same title? Because yeah, you absolutely. I don't. Uh, I don't ever have you do two in in, in yeah. a week. It's just the war of independence, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's that one. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I I think it was an older uh, an older one. I don't know what happened, but I I seem to have doubled up on that, and I apologize. But absolutely, uh, at, at most, what I give you in a week is um, an argumentative assignment and a quiz. But but yeah, not two argumentative assignments. All righty. Anybody else? Okay. So um, looking at number the, the first few numbers, okay, uh, they come right out of um, this argumentative assignment that you guys are doing this week. Let's see here, uh, one through eight. So one through eight on your study guide for test two are literally found within that packet of the, the argumentative assignment of the war for independence, okay? So um, with number one, um, has anyone read the intro yet? Uh, anybody wanna take a crack at number one with historical context? Remember context is just relevant surrounding circumstances, right? So what's going on, what was going on just prior to the war for independence that we ought to consider uh, relevant in, in the sense that it may have um, had some kind of influence on it, right? And so I write number one, I, write, I wrote that in the intro. Uh, anybody? All right, so for one, uh, remember I mentioned demographic changes. Remember demography, Demographic is just a categorical uh, unit in the population. Uh, dem de demographics could be by age, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religious persuasion, uh, et cetera, gender, okay? And so demographic changes. Uh, in the mid, uh, the early mid and late 1700s, the 18th century, uh, the population just boomed. It, 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 just, it just mushroomed. And so I have stats on that in the introduction, okay? And so, um, and also dispersion of the population. Uh, a lot of urbanization, people moving from country areas into the cities. Uh, and uh, I quoted a couple historians where they contended that the city um, institutions, their government, uh, their uh, constable office, like their sheriff's office, et cetera, were not ready to triple a number. Uh, as far as continuing with things like crime, et cetera. And so at any rate, and then also a lot of people, it was just the opposite. A lot of people were leaving urban areas also and heading to quote frontier areas. So all three of those, right? Many more people to suddenly rule for England. Um, the cities are becoming overcrowded and then problems that are associated with cities, usually kind of stereotypically um, those arose. Uh, with problems of crime, um, factionalism, different groups that had their own self-interest uh, vying for influence in the government and things kind of heat up as you get higher numbers of people, et cetera. And then the frontier, right? You have drama with Native Americans uh, uh, heading into the frontier. The natives are like, excuse me, this is our land. Um, and then it also had uh, to make it more uh, complicated than that. Uh, the Louisiana territory, for instance, Florida were, um, controlled by uh, Spain and, and France. And so then they had colonists who would come in there. We did that earlier on our colonial uh, assignments. And so you have these people who were there first uh, while these settlers are coming in and like, you know, pardon me. And the settlers are expecting land. They're expecting socioeconomic ascendance. They wanna squat on land. They wanna become cash crop farmers and make a living and, and improve their status. And so, for all those reasons, right, England might consider at the end of the French and Indian War, you know what, we need to restore some order in the colonies. We need to put more of our attention and our royal bureaucracy needs to, uh, needs to uh, clamp down a little bit on these, on these 13 colonies, all right? Um, a, a second thing that I mentioned as far as relevant context, according to many different historians from different schools of thought, is uh, political ambiguity. 
and I give examples of how English common law is, is a combination. It's an amalgamation of several things. It's uh, traditions. It is laws, of course, made by parliament. It is edicts made by uh, kings and queens. It is decisions made by judges. And the combination thereof, it becomes English common law. So they don't have like one written constitution. Uh, they didn't have that. And so, uh, so the point being is that when, when your political system is that messy, right? Uh, there's more room for disagreement. There's more room for differences of opinion and differences of interpretation as to what constitutes English law and what doesn't. Please, someone have a question? All right, so for instance, right, what about these English men um, who move here to the colonies, right? And so they had um, judges had made decisions uh, according to bloodline and saying that, uh, okay, if your dad, if your father was an Englishman and you're born here in the colonies, you, you, uh, the, the, uh, the kingship of the father passes to the son, right? And of course, women are not included nowhere near yet. And so uh, some people thought, okay, then by those decisions, then any man, any young man who is born here in the colonies, but his father was born in Britain, in England, and, in England and or Scotland, right? Then he's automatically entitled to citizenship according to those, those uh, judicial decisions. And then others contend, right? Uh, there was another one where uh, someone was born in Scotland and Scotland technically had been under Great Britain after 1707. And they said, well, they're in the British realms. They're not, they don't have to be in England proper. And so this young man is a citizen. So some people look to that and, and Benjamin Franklin did his homework and he looked at these judicial decisions in the past and said, well, according to this, any of us who are born of English fathers are citizens. According to this other decision, any of us who are born in the English realms, including which includes the 13 colonies, are automatic citizens as of course, white men, property owning men. And so, um, and then thirdly, uh, you had different charters uh, some charters were given to joint stock companies, like com uh, businesses. Some were given to proprietors, like William Penn is a one-man ruler. And then some were uh, royal colonies, where they was directly under royal control. Well, in three or four colonies, it was stipulated in the contract, in their, their, um, the contract to, to colonize, stating that you shall have all the rights of Englishmen uh, if you should decide to go there. And of course, a lot of it came down to favors, politics, and money, right? Trying to lure as many laborers as possible over to the American colonies. Um, some people use the term safety valve thesis, that when at, at times when England was really having a lot of um, combustible uh, protest back in England itself, that there was kind of this, um, this subconscious or secret desire by the government to get rid of the undesirables, to get rid of the poor, the criminal classes, et cetera, right? And of course, they tried to do that in Rhode Island, by the way. It was a penal colony shortly. So at any rate, the idea was, is by all means, we're going to encourage these joint stock companies and these proprietors and these royal governors that we appoint. We're going to encourage them to lure as many of the poor and ambitious here in England out of this country as possible. So the point being, right, with the second part of context, the first being demographic changes made England want to clamp down on us in 1763. The second one, right, being that um, the, uh, the political status of, of white English men was ambiguous. It wasn't clear. It was messy. So it's going to leave room for us to disagree with Parliament and the Crown. And that's exactly what happens when Benjamin Franklin travels across the Atlantic and has debates with Parliament as far as the subjectship is the term they use, the citizenship basically rights and status of our men here in the colonies. All right, any questions on that? All right, and then thirdly, because I felt like it could have gone on forever as far as uh, relevant context, is I just generically entitled it um, stressors basically right so that's the third part to that question number one i need you to know for the test 
demographic changes, then political ambiguity, and the third one are just stressors. Uh, events that happen that put stress on the British Empire, just that generically. And so the French and Indian War, uh, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, uh, there are several wars in the 1700s and uh, changing of the guard uh, from, um, from the liberal uh, Whig party, W-H-I-G, to the conservative Tories, T-O-R-I-E-S. And so you had stressors back at home uh, you had people, a lot of um, building political strife in England itself. Uh, you could look up a guy named John Wilkes, uh, W-I-L-K-E-S. Uh, he was kind of a rabble rouser, uh, said that there were too many rotten districts or boroughs in England that were not well represented by someone whom they had elected into Parliament, and said he was going to change a lot of things once he got into Parliament. Well, he won overwhelmingly in his borough, his district, but Parliament and the king would not even let him be seated because they claimed that he was um, in one way or another had indirectly promoted the violent overthrow of the English government. You had people, um, guys not named uh, Gordon and Trenchard, uh, T-R-E-N-C-H-A-R-D. Gordon and Trenchard had a, um, a, a news article called uh, Cato's Letters and they were always abreast of what the government was doing that was corrupt, especially King George III. And they would, um, they would highlight it. They would highlight it and um, so, so that the English Parliament and Crown decided to crack down on their amendment on their freedom of, of, uh, of the press, uh, claiming they were guilty of, of libel, of written slander. So they had to go on the run. They were about to be arrested several times. And so at any rate, that was another stressor, was political instability back in England itself, all right? And then also drama by the end of the French and Indian War, uh, the, um, the sentiment amongst the Tories, the conservatives, that Americans did not and had not pulled their weight in the French and Indian War. That here the British were fighting uh, out of the area of Pittsburgh to Detroit, and down the Mississippi along the western frontier of the 13 colonies, they were fighting against the French with these strings of forts, right? And they were contending that they were going to uh, liberate that area from French control so that the colonists could go and settle there and be safe from, from French uh, encroachments. And that, of course, they made the argument that the colonists would enjoy and knew that they would enjoy more freedoms and opportunities under Britain than they would under France. And so hence they contended that they weren't just fighting for power over North America uh, against the French, but they were also fighting uh, that, that um, it was to the benefit of the colonists uh, for them to fight and win this war. So when the colonies were requisitioned to bring forth so many militiamen to fight with the British regulars, uh, brought forth to tax the people and, bring, and, and uh, extract so much wealth and money to help uh, feed and clothe the soldiers, right? Not a single colony met its quota, not a single one. A matter of fact, in many cases, in the vice admiralty courts, the vice admiralty courts were like the highway patrol connected to the Navy, and they were to enforce the, uh, the trading restrictions. They caught a lot of Americans smuggling things to the French Caribbean during this war. So how dare us, right? Uh, do such a thing while the British are fighting and dying uh, partially for us. And so that's, that's no way to, um, to, uh, to show our gratitude. So the Tories at the end of the war, at the end of the French and Indian War, especially feeling confident that they've beaten the French, felt like we needed to be put in our place and we needed to help uh, fund the empire. So hence, included in that, in that kind of British crackdown, are going to be taxes that they're going to impose on us without our elected assemblyman's consent. All right, so any questions on that? That was a long one, sorry. All right, so with number two, uh, that's the very first one, all right, on your assignment. And so look for evidence. This is the British perspective, arguably, is that we, we had it too well. We had it too good for too long and we got spoiled. Uh, the British did not enforce 
their mercantilist restrictions on us because under the mercantilist laws, right? Lumber, tar, pitch, tobacco, um, certain key profitable commodities were to only go to England. We could only sell it to England. Anyone else is considered smuggling. Uh, certain enumerated or specifically stated goods had to go to England to be taxed first. But imagine how frustrating that would be if you're a colonial merchant or, um, or even a, a producer here in the colonies and you wanna trade something just down into the Caribbean. Instead, you gotta take it 3000 miles now across an ocean just to have it taxed in Bristol, Liverpool, London. And then when it tax, it's gonna make the price, it, it's gonna make your price less competitive. Uh, after that tax is put, paid on it, uh, you can't go as low on your price to undersell your competitors when it goes all the way back to the Caribbean to be sold. So um, needless to say, a lot of Americans uh, just defied those rules, said those rules were stupid. Uh, George Washington said pretty much as such and that they were nonsensical and they were unfair. And so a lot of them just didn't follow it. Uh, John Hancock, his ship was, um, was captured when things started getting tense before the war for independence. Uh, and he was to be made a, um, an example because it was very apparent to everyone on both sides that he had become rich illegally that he didn't have the legal papers to trade in the commodities and to trade in the markets uh, that, where he was trading, all right? So there was resentment by the British conservative Tories, for sure. Um, so, so hence, right, economically, we pretty much did what we wanted to begin with, and we got spoiled. Uh, we, we, we gained a sense of entitlement, right? Um, I liken it to, and it, I don't liken it to, I'm sure I read this somewhere, heard it somewhere, but just to like a, a, a son or daughter who the, the father is oftentimes, the father might have some, um, some rather uh, strict uh, uh, rules and regulations, but he's never around. He's always too busy. He's always at work. He's always gone on other business uh, to enforce it. And so the son or daughter just becomes self-sufficient and just does what he or she uh, you know, uh, deems appropriate. And then suddenly the father comes home and that son or daughter is 18, 19 years old. And the father says, you know, hey, we're, we're, I'm, we're gonna enforce these rules now. And the son or daughter says, sorry, dad, it's a little, too little too late. I've, I'm self-sufficient now. I know how to get by. I've, I've, been, I've, I've done well without you. Uh, you're, you're not coming back and becoming stringent upon me now. So at any rate, that's the economic part of the thesis. And then politically, uh, similarly, right, is I give it evidence under Paul Johnson's book, and also to be honest, under our textbook, uh, whereby the colonies, right, with the salutary neglect thesis, whereby the colonies are going to um, politically take advantage of British absence. So for instance, Massachusetts Bay Colony under the Puritans, they had a broad statement whereby it stated that they were to be sovereign in their realms uh, over all, um, pretty much over all neighbors and competitors. Uh, this was given by one king, right? For generations, they're gonna lord that over Plymouth, Connecticut, Rhode Island, over the Native Americans, et cetera. And on two occasions, they're gonna get in trouble with the British government for wielding their power uh, too, um, too belligerently. And they're gonna come in and crack down on them and put them on the same status as those other New England states. And that's what they call it, New England. So it's kind of ironic. Uh, New Englanders are proud of that term, but New England, when that term was put upon them, it was not, the circumstances were not well. It was punitive, uh, punishing Massachusetts Bay putting them on equal footing with little Connecticut and Rhode Island under a British governor. But at any rate, right, that happened twice just with Massachusetts Bay. Pennsylvania and Virginia both claim land in the frontiers that British Parliament had to get involved and say, no, it is not clear in your charter that your land stretches that far westwardly, um, that you are not entitled to that land. That's the Native Americans land. And of course, they weren't often doing that as out of humanitarianism toward the natives. They were doing it because they were making money with the natives with the fur trade and other uh, components like that. 
or had a costly war with the natives and didn't want to fight anymore and wanted to keep the peace with the natives. And so hence keep English pioneers out of their lands. So at any rate, right, uh, I give examples of the colonial assemblies in particular, the elected representatives gaining more and more powers for themselves. Uh, there was a case in Maryland whereby someone was accused of smuggling and um, the colonial assembly made a deal with the proprietor and council saying, if you allow us to have a trial by his peers, we promise we will convict him. And they did. So they convicted him. But what had just happened? The, the people in Maryland, the smuggler, had just been tried by his peers, his fellow colonials, rather than by British uh, agents of the Navy and the Customs Office uh, of the Vice Admiralty Courts. And that was all the difference in the world, because going to a Vice Admiralty Court to an English colonist was like going to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Like you, you go away from everyone, you're, you're surrounded by army men uh, under army laws and traditions, and you can't appeal to anybody outside of them. So it's scary stuff as far as your rights and your chance of being exonerated, right? Declared innocent are, are, are smaller. But now like in Maryland, you're tried by your peers. They said, okay, under English common law, it's by precedent, by following tradition. So now we've just acquired that, people said, all the way in Delaware and other areas. Maryland got to do it, so now we get to do it. And of course, the British didn't agree with that. But nevertheless, so hence, we gained a sense of, um, of independence and a sense of um, uh, entitlement uh, for being left alone uh, for so long as colonists, that we did what we wanted economically, politically, we, we uh, accrued and gave ourselves powers that the English never really intended to deliberately give us. And so hence, when they tried to crack down on us, we were a strong, powerful, grown up, uh, but quote, spoiled kid and said, nope, dad, too little, too late. And we fought to keep a good thing going. All right. And then um, number three, numbers three through six, this is court history. And I remember court history is whereby you, um, you praise the winners in American history. And so who are the first winners well, as we become a republic of the United States are the founding fathers, those who were, who were declared to be traitors and rebels during the war for independence, right? So this is the first court history of the, of the country, right? Whereby we're gonna praise the rebels. And so um, you find this with a guy named Bernard Balin. B-A-I-L-Y-N. His name is connected to court history, okay, of the American, quote, revolution. And it's just that, a revolution, right, like in Spanish, when it says give a revolution, like on boxes and so forth, right? Uh, do a 180, turn completely around to a, an entirely different direction. And so hence, that's what Bernard Balin contends that we had, is before this war for independence, we were in a, an archaic old school British system with an archaic old school British culture and, and worldview. And everything changed when we fought for and won independence, okay? And so for one, right, it, it really emphasizes uh, the role of ideas that Americans uh, imbibed, they took in certain ideas that were circulating in the world at that time and they were, they were changed by them. They were influenced by them. They were inspired by them, right? And so one of them is the great, um, or, or the enlightenment. Uh, anybody have any comments from school on the enlightenment as far as any uh, generic or specific examples, definitions? Don't be bashful. So I bet you guys have studied at least a little bit of it in your history classes or if you're taking philosophy, et cetera. Well, with the Enlightenment, right? The main part that we I wanna focus on is that um, they, they largely wanted to change the world intellectually and politically, to me, from what I, what I derived from my studies of the Enlightenment. Intellectually, they wanted a world that was epistemologically modern. That's a big fancy word that doesn't mean anything that fancy. Epistemology 
is the nature and origin of knowledge. How do you come to believe what you believe? So to the enlightenment, the old school epistemology was because my priest told me so, because my parents told me so, because tradition says that it's such, right? To them, uh, that is uncritical. They use the term credulous. Uh, credulous is like gullible, right, that we use today. You're too quick and easily uh, convinced of something that's not necessarily true. So to them, they it's going to help foster, it's going to tie into the scientific enlightenment, as they contend, right, that they believe much more highly in inductive and deductive reasoning, right? So one is that, like the dialectic method of the, of the Greeks. People tend to be, people do not need to learn how to feed themselves as children, right? So people are inherently, uh, uh, they have an inherent drive for self-preservation, right? And then they'll say another uh, axiom, another assumption, in addition to people being selfish, right? Uh, let's say they say that um, people do not like to feel constrained and have their freedoms abridged or, to, or cut short from them, right? So therefore, C, right, is we, we ought to have a government environment. We ought to have an economic system whereby people are free to pursue their own self-interest. According to A, a people being not even learning, happen to be taught how to take care of themselves and as, as a natural instinct. And also they ought to be have a, a relatively free government in light of B because people don't like to be constrained. And so that's, that's the, Gre that's the Greco uh, deductive reasoning or is it inductive? I always get the two mixed up. I apologize, but that's one of them. Okay. And then the other one is basically the scientific method is that you're supposed to suspend all judgment, assume nothing, right? Except for perhaps try to have forth a, um, a hypothesis test that hypothesis with certain constants and one variable set aside at a time, uh, measure, observe, experiment, right? Gather the data, the results, and make a logical conclusion about those results. So the enlightenment was for that, right? They wanted a more modern mind, a more mi modern mindset that we live by because they believed that everything in the world, a lot of them were deist, D-E-I-S-T, is they, they, a lot of them did not believe in the Judeo-Christian God. They believed in, in a clockmaker God, so to speak, uh, a rational deity who's kind of aloof and uninterested and disinterested in what mankind is up to or suffering. But he established all, everything by natural laws that could be discerned by science and by reason and logic, etc. right? And so to them, um, that which is rational, that which is logical, that's what it's that which goes in line with natural laws is better, is healthier, right? Because it, you're going by uh, the purpose of the, of the creator, of this deist creator. So hence they contended that being tyrannical over other people, they looked at Rousseau, right? And Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he said, man was born free, yet everywhere he ironically is in chains, right? And so that the natural state of man made by intended by our creator was to be free right and they call it like in the state of nature before government was was derived uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and other writers postulated that people were free they were nomadic wandering around hunting being preyed upon preying upon other things but they were absolute in personal liberty and a state of, of freedom right and that that's the natural state we ought to be in um, not that entire state of course under a government, we were to have as much freedoms as possible. So at any rate, going to the Enlightenment is these writers, right? Um, Voltaire, right? A woman who followed Voltaire famously said, I disagree with what you're saying, but I defend to the death your right to say it. And a lot of people say that encapsulates Voltaire, uh, her her, her, the guy that she, that she followed, is he was all about intellectual freedom and freedom of, of expression. Uh, he was very iconoclastic, right? Remember iconoclasm is that you wanna smash things that society holds to be sacred. So like uh, South Park, 
uh, South Park cartoon is very iconoclastic, right? They take advantage of, of, um, of ridiculing and doing ironic parody on anything, however sacred to society, right? Christianity, uh, 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 all kinds of things. Anyway, so um, you have Voltaire. So in some ways, some people believe Voltaire indirectly helped lead to our First Amendment, right? The freedom of expression, et cetera. You had some who contended that uh, the rights of suspects, that the key to our preservation of our freedom is not being able to be um, victimized by a police state, right? By uh, a very um, actively involved and um, intrusive police force that, that gets into our property, our business, uh, doesn't give us a right to, to, uh, to defend ourselves in court, et cetera, right? And I would largely think of one guy on that, uh, uh, Beccaria, uh, B-E-C-C-A-R-I-A. So Beccaria, an Italian guy, he wrote on that. And a lot of people believe that Beccaria was very instrumental in our fourth through seven uh, amendments to our later Bill of Rights, all right? And then, of course, um, you had the... Um, the classical liberals and are the Whigs. Well, I don't want to get to that yet. That's a se I separated those. I apologize into different questions. So with the Enlightenment, right, you had the notion of the social contract and natural rights. So go ahead and please write that down for number four on your notes uh, for test two. Because with the Enlightenment, it brought forth notions of natural rights and the social contract. And the social contract is as if imagine if we went as a class on an airplane to uh, across the ocean and we somehow miraculously lived through a crash, but we're marooned on an island. And we started off in a quote, state of nature, uh, each, each man and woman for him or herself. But then we start finding, right, that we do a cost benefit analysis and say, okay, I love my freedom to do what I want from day to day here on this island but I'm progressively hating the fact that I'm feeling more and more anxious because there are a handful of bullies in our class who are taking our stuff, who are stealing our stuff while we're sleeping, taking our cell phones. Uh, um, maybe some of them are, are uh, extorting, coming to some of you and saying, uh, I want you to fish for me or hunt for me or else I'm gonna do this. And they threaten something in you, right? So according to these writers of the social contract, like Rousseau and Locke, is they're going to contend that this is their postulation of how government began and what the purpose of government originally was, and we ought to return to that original purpose. So to them, right, they contend that government was a necessary evil, that people were enjoying their natural state of freedom, but it became at the expense of danger, because some people inevitably with human nature are going to, um, they're going to, um, uh, abuse their freedoms, right? So hence, government is a necessary evil where we get together and say, okay, guys, let's elect about five to 10 of a, amongst ourselves to be our own rulers. They'll rule with our consent. As soon as they stop doing their job well, we'll fire them and hire five or 10 more people to do the job, right? But their sole job is to protect our rights, they're basically to be our protectors of, of our freedoms. They're to protect us from getting our cell phones stolen in the middle of the night, from being extorted to fish or hunt for someone on this island, right? Uh, to to uh, have our persons protected from being beaten up or worse. So at any rate, that's known as a social contract. And they said that because they, they, um, they deduced that that likely was the origin of government, that that is likely the natural way of doing things, and that's the way we ought to return to. So hence, right, King George III doesn't have power to just rule over us arbitrarily. Parliament doesn't have a right to speak for us on our behalf. Instead, we the people need to give our consent, our permission to whoever rules over us and whatever decisions those people make uh, for us, right? Including, of course, taking money out of our pockets by way of, via uh, taxes, right? And so hence taxation by representation, that uh, only those that we give permission to can tax us, can make laws 
that we have to abide by, et cetera, okay? <clears throat> so at any rate, the social contract. And then natural rights, uh, they contended that when we elect those five to 10 people to rule over us, it is an axiom, it's an assumption to be taken for granted that we are to have our lives protected, our liberties protected, and our property protected, okay? And remember, property didn't just apply to, to land and, and inanimate objects that we own, but the notion along with property was that whatever you work for and sweat for, you're, you're entitled to benefit from, not someone else, okay? So property, obviously, the biggest violation of that one is slavery, obviously, okay? So at any rate, life, liberty, and property. And then some wrote, right, that it was man's uh, God-given right to, uh, we talked about Voltaire, to speak his mind and express himself. It's man's God-given right to be protected by arbitrary arrest. Uh, uh, Beccaria, right, wrote about that. It's man's natural right to protect himself with guns. We'll get to that soon. That's the Scottish liberals, all right, to arm himself. It's man's natural right to ascend as high as his talents and efforts will allow him. And with me, that's tied to Diderot, spelled D -I -D -E -R -O -T, Condorcet, spelled D-I-D-E-R-O-T, and Condorcet, C-O-N-D-O-R-C-E-T. Diderot and Condorcet wrote the first encyclopedias. And they wrote that the lay people ought to have the right to learn how to read and write, to be educated, and to rise up the socioeconomic pyramid according to their intelligence and hard work. So to me, Diderot and Condorcet, I think arguably were, were, were part of the uh, inspiration of Jefferson when he added to life, liberty, and property a pursuit of happiness. And then of course also Aristotle. He had read his Aristotle and we won't get into that, but Aristotle wrote that as well. So at any rate, right? The Enlightenment championed all those things. And so the Enlightenment was all about uh, government by consent and natural rights. And remember, a natural right is the fact that you, by nature of having been born a human being, are entitled to those rights automatically. That's different from a civic right. A civic right is a government-granted right, because the argument is what the government gives, the government can take back away, take back from you. But what you're entitled to by nature as a human being, they can't extract from you. They can't take that from you, okay? So hence natural rights, freedom or uh, government by consent, um, checks and balances. The enlightenment was about balance. They believe that the natural universe was about balance. So hence there should not be one sector of the, of the uh, government that has predominant um, power over the others, right? And with that, I think of Montesquieu. And please don't ask me to spell that. I know it's M-O-N-T-E-S-Q. And then after that, I'm not sure. Uh, U-I-E-A, or it's, it's something close to that. I'm the worst spelling instructor you'll ever have. Never mind that I've, I've read that guy and read of him, but I still don't recall the ending of that, of that name. But the Count de Montesquieu, he wrote about that and how it's the natural way of the universe to have balance. And so hence judges, right? The idea is um, you should have some elected offices to, to, uh, to um, be connected to what the majority of people want. However, says this notion, sometimes the majority of people can become as tyrannical as one person, right? What if, let's say, theoretically, 51% decided to enslave the other 49%. And they said, hey, we won by majority vote, right? They, they call that generically um, tyranny of the majority. So hence, there ought to be balance. There ought to be judges and other appointed people who are not pop, uh, publicly accountable, do not have to worry about being popular in the decisions they make, but represent the minority, right? So there's a sense of balance et cetera, et cetera. So our checks and balances in our government all largely um, emanate from the Enlightenment and Montesquieu and his writings, all right? Uh, any questions on number four? I know that was a, a, a big one.
All right. Tanya's at work, huh? Doing some medical work. Are you guys, I can't imagine how busy you guys are. I, I appreciate all the more you guys doing your job uh, uh, here with me as well. So let's see here. Uh, the Great Awakening. The Great Awakening, so remember what we're talking about now are supporting data of court history that our founding fathers imbibed these ideas of their time and they, did, they decided to have a revolutionary change for the better, right? Because the idea of court history oftentimes is what they call it American exceptionalism, that we are exceptional. We're uniquely better than other countries. Most countries, right, we, the argument goes, are born upon blood and ambition and lust for power, but not America. America saw these lofty ideals about freedom, opportunity, etc., and we fought to enact a world where that would be safeguarded. Those great things would be safeguarded. You know what I mean? So that's why this is considered court history. So we did the enlightenment as the ideas that we imbibed and were influenced by, and then now um, the Great Awakening. Great Awakening was a, re um, was a religious movement, and it was an anti-institutional movement of religion, whereby there was a lot of resentment and waning or diminishing respect for Anglican clergy. Uh, remember, from the time of Henry VIII, the English went to the Anglican church, and, um, and it was very hierarchical, like the Catholic church, with archbishops and bishops, et cetera, right, dioceses. And, um, and so a lot of those, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for instance, always sat on the King's Privy Council, no matter what. So there was a connection of church and state, clearly. And so the Anglicans, um, their, their complaint was the Anglican priests and bishops and archbishops have become too worldly, too corrupted with power, too involved in vicious politics, instead of sticking to the Bible and the gospel and preaching uh, Christianity to their parishioners, right? And so hence, the Great Awakening is going to advocate or support nonviolent civil disobedience against the Anglican clergy, saying, if you are convinced that your leading clergymen in your area of the nine colonies that were royal, they automatically had Anglican church as their official state church. But in those uh, colonies, right, if you believe the Anglican clergy is going away from what God wants, then you have every right to defy them. Uh, go and form your own church. So um, hence the Methodist, the Baptist in particular, right? They're going to be these new uh, visualized as democratic Christian denominations where they're going to break forth and branch off the Anglican church off the Presbyterian church and off the congregational church, the three official churches uh, mo almost everywhere in the colonies. And they are gonna have uh, preachers who are uh, elected by their own, although the, the congregational did that with the Puritans, the pilgrims, right? But that was the exception. They're gonna elect their own officers or, or, or preachers. Uh, their preachers do not have to have a PhD in divinity or theology from Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard, uh, Princeton. And so it was a very anti-institutional movement where it was, they said that your, your, um, your relationship with God is to be less formalized. Uh, talk to him while you're out riding your horse. Uh, and so hence they would have these tent meetings and these open meetings out in the open away from churches where you'd have your own relationship with God, have your own experience with Christ or the Holy Spirit, etc., And so the Great Awakening, some people believe um, at this time, just before the War for Independence, had an effect that if you could believe that you could righteously stand against your own preachers, right, um, then it made it all the more easy to rise against your own royal governor and, and, and the British government, okay? So civil disobedience with the Great Awakening, namely. And then number six, the Whigs. The Whigs were old school liberals, not today's liberals, all right? Old school liberals were libertarian. And remember, libertarian to me is like that, that, um, that flag or whatever that has the snake 
and says, uh, don't tread on me. If you're libertarian, you supposedly have a very um, wary suspicion of government. You believe that there is, um, I, I don't know, like uh, perhaps Lord of the Rings or something, like with the ring, uh, that there is a deadly combination between what lies within human nature and power. That something inherently in us as human beings cannot handle power. Uh, we become insatiable. We can never have enough of it. Uh, Jefferson wrote to John Adams when they were having their debate with one another um, in, in correspondence. He said, you know as well as I that we would become wolves if the people let us. And that was admitting to themselves, right? So how much more did they think that was true with the British? That anyone would become a tyrant if you let him or her be such, become such. So hence with the Whigs, right? They wanted government to stay as small and unobtrusive into your life and my life as possible. And so what they believed, uh, incidentally from that, is that government ought to stay small and localized, that you ought to largely be, uh, be governed in your own locale, uh, here in the mid, the Central Valley of California, for instance, kind of govern ourselves as much as possible. And that, um, there ought to be a, a loose confederation of our region here, then the regions further up Northern California, then Southern California. We ought to have a loose confederation whereby the Southern Californians never have enough power to lord any decision over us here in the Valley, that we're largely under our own elected reps here of, of the Valley here with us, right? And so hence they also were for confederacies. And to me, confederacy is just whereby every locality is almost sovereign, is almost autonomous, is almost independent, but just with few, a few um, exceptions. Let's say there's an invasion of California, then that would constitute an emergency and Southern and Northern California would have to unite with our government and even perhaps dictate to us what to do militarily. So with just a few exceptions, right, uh, these libertarian Whigs were for um, decentralized, localized, elected government, okay? <clears throat> also, the Whigs, they praised the common e uneducated person. What they thought was, and Thomas Jefferson is going to contend this himself, is that whatever the common person gets wrong out of ignorance shall never be as detrimental to our freedoms as what an educated man does wrong morally and does it deliberately with his eyes wide open, who knows full better, who's not naive about political science and government, right? And so to a lot of people, uh, they, they thought there was, a, a, with a Whig party, they thought that there was sagacity, right? Like I use that term with John Smith in court history, a lot of worldly smart intelligence, common sense that the average person brings to the table. To government, all right? And so to the Whigs, <clears throat> they believe you cannot start a domino effect of infringement upon our freedoms. The idea was that governing authorities are no dummies. They'll start by just claiming emergency powers and claiming they need to just take one small freedom away from us and infringe in our personal space just a little bit. But to Whigs, right, I think you know where I'm going with this, don't tread on me libertarian rhetoric, as they said, once the devil is at your door and you open your door even a little bit and he gets even a foot inside, he's coming in there to stay. He's going to do it by increments, by steps, but he's doing it in a sly fashion. So hence to Whigs, right? Uh, parliament taxing us without letting our elected reps give their permission to it. The, the taxes themselves, like the stamp tax, was like, what was it, like a quarter of a pence? Like not even an eighth of a penny. It was very cheap even for back then. It was not what they use the term onerous. It was not burdensome and, and causing us to become poverty stricken by any means. But under Whig rhetoric, right, it's the principle of it. We don't care if it's half a penny. If they're doing, if they're taxing us half a penny without our permission today, what are they going to do tomorrow and next year and the year after that? So to Whigs, right, 
everything was uh, symbolic. Everything was, um, was uh, it's centered around uh, precedent, beginning in a, a beginning example of things to follow, okay? And so hence uh, the idea, right, uh, with your second amendment, with the Whigs, right, is that I may not need an AK-47, but on principle, if the government wanted to declare martial law against us as civilians, we need to be armed with weaponry that theoretically can help us hold our own against our own military, which of course to a lot of people today, they laugh about that, right? Because we're not going to have nuclear weapons or anything like that, like the government has. But that was the principle of the Whigs, right? Don't tread on me. I'm ready at a moment's notice, right? The Minutemen uh, to defend my rights and the rights of others. And that if there was any law granted or liberty granted in the English past, so hence it should become law, right? Because English common law is by precedent. And they retract it. They go backwards on it. Look out. Tyranny is coming sometime down the road. All right? So they're claiming, right, to fight over any infringement of our rights based upon principle. All right, let's see here. So then also, um, number seven, Joseph Ellis's book on George Washington. When you look at that, you'll see it in the title, okay? Is look for evidence that the founding fathers were at least partially led by self-interest, all right? Uh, with, with, with this number in particular, look for evidence of George Washington's ambitions being thwarted. He tries to rise up in the military and see what happens to stop him. He tries to make money as a cash crop farmer and see what frustrates him and takes away from his profits. Okay. And so, but I want to give credit where credit's due to the author is Joseph Ellis, his biography on Washington He's not just simply claiming that it was sour grapes, although he does believe a lot of that was included into the, into the truth of this, this situation. But it wasn't just the argument that if Washington had just been able to fulfill his ambitions, he would have sided with the British instead of the rebels, that it was just sour grapes. He was mad because he couldn't do what he wanted under the British, and that was his selfish reason for rebelling. But I think there's more to it than that, is Ellis, and I don't know how well I conveyed it in the write-up, but Ellis also conveyed the fact that to Washington, there was nothing wrong with him wanting to, um, to uh, fulfill his own ambitions, and that there ought to be a, a society, a government, an economic system, whereby not just he, George Washington, but everybody else as well ought to be free to pursue his or her own self-interest. Right. And so that I, I want to give credit where credit's due and the, to the author and to Washington himself so that it, it's not just critical of George Washington. All right. Howard Zinn's thesis. I don't know on number eight how you could see anything other than critical on this thesis. A very cynical, negative look at the war for independence. Right. Look for evidence of the US, the American colonies constituting many different factions. A faction being a group that shares the same self-interest and perspective and worldview, right? So you have the poor artisans, the poor skilled workers who were trying to get by. You have the indentured servants who were trying to get by. You have the slaves, of course. You have the small uh, subsistence farmers, who were just growing their own food just to survive, just to, to, to cultivate what they could live off of and eat, right? You had the merchants trying to sell one thing from one place to another market, right? And that hence, they all had their own agendas. They all had their own uh, perspectives. And um, so when the war breaks out, right, there's the notion that the specific demographic of the founding fathers, if you fast forward, to the Constitutional Convention, right? Like, what was it, like 51% of the, um, over half, over half the founding fathers, right, were uh, in positions that were considered the intelligentsia, 
those who are in their positions by virtue of their education, uh, lawyers, a big demographic amongst the founding fathers, right? Um, uh, Well-to-do merchants, right? Uh, writers and newspaper journalists, etc. cetera. Uh, professors uh, at the big universities. So at any rate, when you look at the real world, right? Uh, outside that convention, then those who were college educated were less than 1%, fewer than 1% for sure, okay? And so hence, they were not a microcosm. They were not a mini example of, of the society that they were representing, right? They were the cream of the crop. So hence to Howard Zinn, these founding fathers, when they saw the regular hoi polloi, the regular commoners engaging in protest and, and feeling rage in a sense of class warfare against the, the, the well-to-dos, that they didn't want to become a victim themselves to the poor's wrath. So what did they do very cleverly? Is they hijacked the poor's movement. They said, hey, we're one of you. We'll let us lead you and we'll provide a land of opportunity for all of us. We'll provide a land with freedoms and, and, and uh, liberties for all of us, right? And so hence, Howard Zinn depicts the founding fathers as demagogues, as, as manipulators of the demos, of the common people, okay? And so, because they didn't want the wrath of the poor to be directed toward them, right? And so what do they do with that wrath? They deflect it and they redirect it toward the British. So the British are nothing less, according to Howard Zinn, than scapegoats. Said, hey, you're miserable in your status, indentured servants, because the British, it's their fault. It's their policies. It's their governments, right? Never mind the fact that the founding fathers constituted the majority of the elected assemblymen who were already running uh, half of government and the colonies before the war for independence and hence were to blame for some of this neglect of the poor. So Howard Zinn is a Marxist historian. He sees <clears throat> different classes and the capitalist system as inherently parasitical, that oftentimes one faction wants to benefit at the expense and harm of another faction, right? <clears throat> he empathizes with those who lost. And in this case, right, he believes the poor white demographic uh, lost along with African Americans and Native Americans and women uh, who are marginalized, right? And we'll get to that more later. Um, but they lost because they were, they were, instead of having a true genuine revolution from the bottom and a, a true revolutionary change, they were tricked. They were manipulated by these well-to-do founding fathers who were secretly afraid of them. So that the idea is, right, if you're well-to-do and you have a lot of wealth and you see a revolution coming, right? You don't want to give away your backyard and your, all your money and, 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 and privileges and, and give them out equally to everyone else. So you don't want that stove. When people are turning that stove up metaphorically on how hot a revolutionary movement and insurrection is going to become, right? The people at the bottom, they may want to turn it all the way past nine or 10 to high, right? and have land redistribution, free the slaves, do some radically hot stuff, right, metaphorically. But if you're well-to-do and you're in control, you want to keep your finger on the stove button and just say, well, I'm willing to give this much. I'll give basic freedoms and opportunities to the poor, but I'm darn sure not going to do anything to change property contracts and so forth because I want to keep my wealth. So I'll turn the stove up to about four and I'll keep it there no higher than four, right? So reform from above is almost always more conservative uh, because those who stand the most to lose want to conserve as much of the status quo as possible for obvious reasons, out of self-interest. So any questions, you guys, on one through eight? I've blabbed, I've blabbed it through. Blabbed it through. Just so I'm, I'm clear, because I got here kind of late, yeah. um, we're going over chapter five? We are, yes. I believe it. It's, uh, gosh, I, I don't have my book here with me. I apologize. It's on the War for Independence. There are two, okay. basically two, right? There's one is Empire in Transition. I think, it, I think you're right, though. I think it's four and five. 
One's empire okay. transition, and the other one is just the war for independence or the revolution, right? So yes, we're doing those chapters, and we've done numbers one through eight for test number two, okay? okay. And now we've gone through for, the numbers on your argumentative assignment. I was looking for who you were just talking about right now, uh, Howard Zinn. Yeah. And I couldn't find him, and I was just wondering if he was in chapter five or four. No, hun, that's the thing, right? Is you won't find him in the textbook. Like I, I said at the very beginning, you may have missed is that um I want I want the different parts to my class to to uh to supplement one another, right? So hence the textbook, I wanted to give you a basic narrative of what happened chronologically, right? And introduce certain ideas about uh the way things are interpreted. But that's it for the for the textbook. Then okay. the argumentative assignments, right? I want you to become familiar with specific historians and what their very one-sided perspectives were, right? And have okay. you critically think in those argumentative assignments? You know what I mean? Okay. Huh? So yes. Yeah. So um, so I deliberately put things like Howard Zinn in the argumentative that I know you're not going to find in the textbook. Okay. Okay. So yeah, but you'll find Howard Zinn on the very last section should you choose it. Okay. okay. And please recall, guys, read all of them. Okay. Uh, read the intro and read all of them, no matter which numbers you choose. And also remember, is uh, I don't recall, I need to get back online to look, but I'm, I may have asked you to choose two sections on this one, okay? So always look you for that. I think to read, um, read the first two paragraphs and then write on one or the other. I okay, believe. good, good. So yeah, whatever I have on there, just make sure you read it carefully, okay? And um, absolutely. All right. Um, anything else, you guys? Any other questions or comments? You guys feel pretty confident in, in your, your argumentative assignment for Sunday and on numbers one through eight of your next test? Yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. Everyone else, can I can I interpret your 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 silence as as a good thing? Yes. Good, yeah. Good. good. Thank you, Lisette. I appreciate that. All right. And so that's all I feel like is my job, okay, is to try to get you guys to critically think, get you guys to learn the basics of U.S. history. And then uh, when I test you on it, to have moments like now uh, to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks, to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're reading and what we're studying and so forth. And I, I honestly do not say this um, uh, disingenuously. You guys are so intelligent. You guys, uh, I, I really look forward uh, to reading your, um, your argumentative write-ups. You guys are, are nailing these things. You're doing very well. All right. So if, if that's it, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and let you go, okay? You guys have a good day, a good week. Make sure you turn this in by Sunday evening. Okay, and um, and have a great week. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.